conference. My name is Darren Schulte. I'm the chief medical officer uh, at a company called Apixio. Um, and uh, what I intend to do today in the time we have together uh, is really uh, introduce a topic that is becoming uh, more widely uh, discussed in the realm of being able to leverage and use information and data uh, with respect to uh, hopefully uh, you know, overcoming many of the challenges we face in healthcare delivery, quality, and outcomes. Um, so what I intend to, you to do today is to out outline some of the challenges that we're facing uh, in using patient clinical data for various different purposes related to either quality cost, utilization, and the like. Um, describe some of the ways in which usually big data analytic techniques are going to be used uh, to uh, uh, really add the, uh, look at some of these challenges and then provide a couple of use cases and the like. So just quickly, uh, a background for Apixio, and then this will be the last time you're going to see any sort of pitch. This, com this is, uh, discussion isn't meant to be a pitch for anything necessarily that we do, but that Apixio, just so you know, uh, is a company that is a little over, a little less than three years old based in the Silicon Valley. We brought mar uh, products to market in uh, mid-2010. Uh, we uh, offer data mining, aggregation, and analytic solutions for uh, healthcare organizations that go at risk. Uh, that's providers or payers. Uh, increasingly, that distinction about going and, and assuming risk is one that's blurred increasingly over time as payment incentives are changing. Um, we bring technology insights from both inside and outside healthcare. The outside healthcare part's very important because certainly the challenges that healthcare faces, and dare I say the technology in IT and healthcare is at least two to three decades behind other industries in our economy. Um, and we've got, uh, as part of our solution sets, data, deep data for over 1.4 million patients. These are data that's very deep and rich uh, and go back as far as 10 years or more. And from that, we can derive many uh, very valuable insights. Um, so what is big data? Big, big data is not just a noun, it's a verb. Okay, big data is looking at information not only in big volumes, but all the ways in which the data presents itself in healthcare. The data is messy, the data is not structured, and I'll describe for you that, uh, and some of which, of course, can be coded for various different purposes. Um, but really, what we're talking about in big data is the verb, which is the data-driven insights. What can we gain from this information? Uh, how can we mine these uh, information using, uh, really, and this is going to be important that I'll touch upon, the new techniques that are being leveraged in computing. So think cloud storage, think distributed computing, uh, think Amazon. When you think of data-driven insights, think Google. These are the things in which we're used in other industries to really get us to, you know, the 21st century, and this is where we would like to bring healthcare uh, as well. Relevant trends for healthcare. Okay, so we are in a revolution in healthcare, albeit slowly. Um, but this is coming from several different trends that we're now seeing. Uh, number one, you got to get the incentives right, and I think we're starting to go there. So risk is shifting from just primarily payers to now providers, so there's more skin in the game, in ways in which we're going to then transform from not just sick care, but healthcare. Data is becoming digitized, and that's important. You can't operate on patient records that happens to sit in the file cabinet of physicians' offices. And data is increasingly being liberated, albeit again slowly, liberated by means of health information exchanges or liberated by means of interfaces and all the ways we can talk with one another in systems. Um, and so with that, uh, you have the ability then to ask yourself, how can we use these information and these data now liberated, or increasingly so, to really derive insights into the who, what, where, when, and how of actually improving the cost and quality uh, and utilization of, of uh, healthcare. And this is where big data, I believe, we believe, comes into play. Um, with this, data-driven insights not only will, I think, improve the picture of the patient's care, Think of this way, the way healthcare operates today, the picture of the patient is like a black and white grainy TV in the 50s. With the data and the big data and techniques and attributes and the ways in which to use information that I'm going to be talking about, we're going to bring the patient picture into an HD crisp 
pick focus in which uh, people are interested in and increasingly viewing their entertainment. That's going to allow us to really get at and overcome some of the even biases that we've assumed or get at information that is thus far has been unknown uh, and bring the evidence back in evidence-based medicine because uh, much of what we do today is actually not based on evidence but expert opinion and the like. So what, th this is important because I think when we talk about let's just get all the data and make something out of it, uh, well, it's more than just a lot of volume of data. It's more than just coded information. Um, it's volumes of data that includes all those nursing notes, encounter notes, procedure notes, images, data from devices, data from patient-centric uh, applications. This is apart from even genomics. So there's a volume of data. It's in tremendous amount of variety much of which is not structured whatsoever, much of which though is interesting and very informative about patient care. So there's a volume and variety to the big data, that's the noun. The verb is how do you extract value out of this information. Now aggregating and analyzing information, you need to do and operate upon information that's messy and information that again isn't structured. And it could be archived and used in various different ways and there's a frameworks that are being created and I'll touch upon it for innovative statistical techniques and others to actually operate upon and make sense of all these differences in the way that information is presented about the patient. And then there's velocity. We talk about population health management and, and we talk about it in the terms of go sweeping across these data making sense of it and bringing it together, not only for some batch reporting process, but for real-time results. So you're gonna need systems that are gonna enable you to do truly real-time, in addition to batch-level analytics and reporting across these volumes and variety of information. This is what big data uh, is about and what's beginning to be uh, you know, discovered. And this is underway in healthcare, but again, it's, it's slow going. Let's just take a mid-sized healthcare system. So, so these are the challenges. Let's talk about the challenges of data. And, and I, I just need to bring it into sharp focus to understand at least what we're talking about volume. This is a 200,000 patient, uh, 200 provider healthcare organization, pretty middle of the road, right? Uh, it could be, you know, a, 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 in your community. Let's talk about five years of data for these patients. Could be discrete data, text, scan notes. When I mean scan notes, I mean that when pa physicians are distributing notes back and forth between practices to get into the electronic record, increasingly as physicians are using, you need to scan that in. You need to scan it and make it a PDF document, and you put it in a folder, and it sits there in the EHR, and you need to make sense of it. Right? So that's what I mean by when I mean scan notes, in addition to textual notes, which is all that free text generated in the EHR. And increasingly, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about typewritten. I'm not talking about any paper charts that happen to be around. That's nearly 10 terabytes of data. 10 terabytes of data. Or the entirety of the Library of Congress. So this is the data, right? And most of it's unstructured. 90% of it does not have any codes related to it, whether diagnostic, whether procedure codes, whether NDC or LOINC or any of the codes that population health management today unfortunately operates upon, 90%. This is just not our number. In fact, this is numbers that we've determined from our data. Kaiser publicly reported at a conference we were speaking at recently at Intel in, in San Francisco, 90% of their data is unstructured too, and guess what, they're grappling with it. A closed system like Kaiser is saying, how do I understand and operate on these data in a way that's gonna make meaningful sense? And guess what, guys, the sliver, that green sliver there, that's the coded data that we're trying today to provide decision support, you know, understanding of quality and costs. And no doubt, Dr. Mary in the other uh, room, if you all saw her, the MGH physician, no doubt she has to go through lists and lists of care gaps and say, well, I did that. That colonoscopy was provided because she's operating not on care gaps, but data gaps. She's operating on data gaps, and that's inefficient. And you won't be able to drive insights if, if you operate on data gaps. So this is the uh, most data, big data. Most of it is unstructured. And if you look at that unstructured data, at minimum, studies have shown both hours and published academic studies that at least 60% or more of the key clinical information about patients is in that unstructured narrative and not coded. And as a physician, if there's any physicians in the room, how many people in the room are clinicians? Okay, right. 
you all can understand, and even non-clinicians, when you see the patient, you're typing notes. You're not indicating ICD-9 codes this and CPT codes that and what have you. You're writing in that richness. Or the health management vendors in the room whose nurses are tirelessly talking about and telephonic or inpatient management of the patients, those nursing notes are being created and they're sitting there. But in there is the richness of information that we need to unlock and that's beneath the surface. And decision support will fail without access to clinical data. This is a use case. It's a use case that I'm describing. It was published in the New England Journal by Tejal Gandhi's group in 2011. And this was prompted by a case in which a patient without a spleen, who had a splenectomy, uh, almost died from a bacterial infection in the blood because the patient didn't receive a recommended pneumococcal vaccination that, that nobody would deny as an evidence-based practice ought to be done every five years. And they looked back and they said, how could this happen in the partner's healthcare system at Harvard? All 1.4 million patients were on electronic record, going back at least five years. And they found that 71% of those patients without a, splenectic, a spleen did not have that coded on their problem list. This is Harvard. Those patients without a coded splenectomy were three times less likely to receive a recommended vaccination. There's many reasons why, of course, you wouldn't receive, I mean, only 54% of those with the coded history received the recommended vaccination, so certainly there's, this is a multivariate problem. Uh, but it has to start with information. And the problem list, as all the clinicians in the room can attest to, is the starting point. The problem, we're taught in medical school, so problem-oriented uh, you know, approach to patient care. Right? This is Harvard. This is operating on data gaps. No amount of alerting. In fact, if you alert physicians based upon data gaps, all you're going to get is the physicians like Dr. Mary who are increasingly frustrated. They're going to say, I, 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 I'm having to go and do data abstraction on my own. And that's not a good use of my time, and I'm not operating on the top of my license. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is now, now we have to ask ourselves, how do I interoperate between all the different ways in which concepts about the patient can be represented in these data? And a concept could be a clinical condition. It could be a procedure performed for the, physician, uh, the patient. It could be other services. You have all these different data systems and sources that are going to interoperate with one another, and you have to resolve which, what are the concepts that you can use to then analyze against, interoperability. Um, there is no standard. There, there is no standard to, for doing this. And if you're going to do any kind of insights or analytics, you're going to need to start with this. And so this is a case study that Epixer actually had done, which is called a big data approach to establishing relationships between concepts in data, both that resolve a particular condition or procedure or relationships between different uh, concepts in medicine that we can then use. And what we started from is to create a dictionary, four and a half million terms that started from existing ontologies that are already being used, leaf nodes all the different uh, conditions, whether in ICD-9 or SNOMED or LOINC or the like, extracted a dictionary that then we used uh, UMLS terms, MESH terms, provider and patient friendly terms from clinical encounters, and put it all together into this milieu of four and a half million terms, concepts, everything that you can use to even describe the patient's care, conditions, and the like. And then using big data statistical techniques, not people sitting in a room deciding this ICD-9 code maps to this or you know, this maps to this. We actually say, how does this statistically co-occur in data? How is it that these, any two concepts relate to one another in terms of their strength of association? Let the data tell us how concepts relate with one another and how you interoperate among these different code sets and, and types. Not only just standard codes, but proprietary as well. And so this became a knowledge graph, a basis for which you can in, uh, operate upon data uh, that has multiple different ways in which to present the care of the patient. Th then the next question that occurs now that you can interoperate perhaps between all the different ways in which information is presented is how do I assemble knowledge with all these different sources and different variety of information that's coming at me? I've got not only volume, but I've got variety of data. And I want to add value to the data, but to do so I need to understand and structure it in some way. Right? So what we did is we said, well, the source of information that's coming in, we're going we're to understand the concepts that relate to that patient, whether it's coded like simvastatin or Zocor's drugs, whether it's a liver function test that's been coded for, or whether that data is in documents. And the data in documents, if it's a scanned information, we can understand it using optical character reader technology. So you could take a PDF document and you can actually resolve the text. 
Then you can look through and determine which of the concepts are in there using statistical techniques and data mining techniques and understand concepts related to the patient and then meta tag. The system automatically meta tags the data much in the same way that you understand how does Google, how does Google enable you to search the web in milliseconds? Google keeps multiple copies of the web and they meta tag all the information on the web so they can make relationships with one another and enable your query to return a result in real time. This tagging lends structure to the data. And so what we're doing is we're tagging in multiple different ways, one of which is to tag with synonyms. So if we know a code is related to that particular concept, you tag. Or a synonym related to a provider or a patient-friendly term, or an acronym, or the like. All of these meta tags then create this mathematical representation of a patient that then now you can ask and answer specific questions for analytics. Text mine, you can use natural language processing, you can map and infer and model because now you have this rich representation of the patient in multiple dimensions and add structure to data that is textual in nature. So that's the second step. How do I add value to data that's in multiple different uh, uh, structures, varieties, and the like? How I compute upon, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but here's where cloud computing is gonna come into play. So we have 10 terabytes of data in the mid-sized health system. We've got documents and, and text and all of this different information we need to make sense of. Now we have to operate on it in real time. Well, one is you can buy a lot of hardware and servers because you're gonna need a lot of computing power to do this. And I won't go through all the, all the specifics, but this is where com parallel computing, the way Amazon or Google does its work in the cloud, enables you to return results in real time. And, and I won't go the way we do it, but there's lots of ways in which to use open source technology developed by Yahoo and Facebook to enable real-time results to be returned using cloud computing so that healthcare systems don't need to you know, purchase and become their own IT shop with hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in, in servers to be able to do this. Because again, computing power is gonna get us there if you're gonna operate on these data. All right, let's shift. So if you're with me, I've taken you through big data tour de force. I've talked about big data challenges, talked about di big data is not just a noun, but a verb, very important. I think if nothing else, if you walk away from this talk, uh, the insights that you can gain for that 90% of data that's unstructured so that you're not talking about data gaps, but real care gaps or insights. Let's talk about three examples that would illustrate this in part. I'm talking about problem lists. So what Dr. Mary described in that other session previous to this one, the problem list that may be inaccurate or, you know, it's a starting point for determining a registry, uh, determining uh, those that are going to be eligible for particular uh, programs or the like. Uh, I'm going to talk through quality measurement and we'll talk through risk uh, prediction as case studies or ways in which to operate on these data using uh, the techniques that I've described. Here's a real example. It's eye-opening once you look at these data. It's absolutely eye-opening. This, this particular patient and their problem list, this is in their primary care. If we looked at the coded layer, which the problem list is really a coded data, because all the problem list is in the EHR is ICD-9 codes that have been added for one purpose or another. And we found that this patient had coronary disease, among others. When you looked in the encounter notes, and you, we uh, mined those data and tagged relevant information, we found the patient had hypertension. Nowhere in the problem list. Then, because we can bring together multiple sources of data, not just from that EHR, but other EHRs with, through our data aggregation, we found that there was a scanned cardiology note. By the way, Mr. Primary, as you're aware, this patient has had a heart attack in the past and had a stent placed in the mid right corner. Nowhere in the problem list. So, so, so this problem list is the basis for disease registries, for what am I going to do to care manage, eligibility for measures, and, and this is the starting point. And this is not uncommon. So there's different techniques you have to, that we can do so that it's not people that are going through charts one by one saying I'm going to clean up a problem list or making a physician have to sit there and determine, well, did this person really have this or that? Um, and I won't go through in much detail, but there's methodologies that we've employed to um, actually use machine learning models. Machine learning models are the way that computers were actually trained to be grandmasters of chess or backgammon or other things, or the Watson computer to do some of the, you know, the beat the Jeopardy champion, right? So these models, in this case, can actually determine and look through information and say, what's, what is the, in, all the linguistics that would give us a sense for the problems in this particular patient in the chart, and then give us insights we would normally not have? So we've trained models to detect heart failure as an example and other conditions, and with that, 
You then can look at the encounter information and say, what in fact is there in terms of conditions and compare that to what's been coded for and then be able to say to, in various different ways, to physicians or others, these are conditions to consider to add to the problem list or add to the data you would use for risk adjustment or whatever else. And again, you make sense of all that richness of information where it holds all, the, all that data. Uh, and again, not just in your EHR, but in information that comes from across your health system where you may be using multiple different EHRs. So this is not even a problem within the EHR, it's a problem of data that comes from multi multiple sources. And this, this advancement in text mining uh, that we would use to operate on these data using big data techniques is not just to clean up the problem list and find those problems that are not in the list, but also take problems that are in the list to say there's no clinical evidence for this. But nothing that we would do, and this is where actually we're kind of in the forefront here thinking about this, nothing that we would do would be one that's just automatic that there could be a validation step in which you would have clinicians or others to say, well, is this information that you're presenting to me you know, valid or that I could review um, or spot check? No computer models are going to be perfect, uh, but it's going to be a lot faster, cheaper, and quicker to do this than, patient, than people going through and abstracting data from the charts one by one. Uh, and so, you know, thinking through ways in which to validate, uh, we have a tool in which we present, there's patients opportunities, diabetes without complication in a particular visit note that we found that was not in the problem list. This was used for Medicare Advantage risk adjustment. Every year you need to risk adjust in order to get a, a particular payment for your Medicare Advantage patients. The problem there is that conditions aren't coded for year over year. 40% of those patients with conditions are not noted in that particular year, and therefore uh, the provider groups are not appropriately paid, and you're not appropriately managing those patients with conditions. So here this is, we mine the data from a particular notes. Here's the information about this uncomplicated diabetes, and the coder or a physician could validate it, spot check it, and say, yes, this is, you know, this accuracy um, in terms of this particular condition being relevant in the chart and should be promoted to the problem list. And certainly there's workflows to do this so that Dr. Mary's not going through each and every one of these. And this is something that to, to, to work out, certainly. But this is at the forefront of actually being able to take information the way it's in that deep data and actually make sense of it to improve our view of the patient, which is step one. Okay, let's shift to quality measures. So Dr. Mary again, and there was talking about population health management, and her third, her third case was about working lists. So, so here's the problem, guys, right? So the pioneer ACOs are going to be reporting on the ACO 33 next year for determining whether they get shared savings. But guess what? Like two-thirds or more of the data needed for those measures cannot be reliably taken from coded data. There are measures in which we're looking, if you're eligible for the measure, you need to have an ejection fraction study done. Nobody in here, I think, who's familiar at all with coded data can tell you there's an ejection fraction which determines your functioning of the heart anywhere in coded data. Anywhere. Either eligibility for the measure, determining whether you've complied with the measure. And shared savings are on the line. So what are your options? Well, you can make Dr. Mary key in every, every time he, she sees a patient. Well, we did the ejection fraction, colonoscopy was done five years ago, or this person has a clinical condition that's in the chart that actually makes this person, you know, ineligible for this measure. That's not scalable. That's not scalable. You're not making your practice at the top of the license. It doesn't, this is not the answer. We would suggest, I would suggest. You can make nurses or administrators manually audit these charts, and they do. There's an academic medical center we work with for purposes of PQRS measure reporting, and the same for the ACO, who get armies of medical students to sit there every year and go through the charts. Go through the charts, literally. That's not scalable. It's, you can report upon it every year, but how are you supposed to put that into a decision support tool to actually improve upon? The physician will say, guess, guess what, I didn't do it, but what tools are you giving me to improve the, the, at the point of care to determine what are the care gaps? That, that isn't scalable. That, that, isn't, that isn't something we could be doing. You can, you can accept underperforming measures, and we are. Or all you do is have process-based measures, right? You say, well, all the measures I need are the measures that I have data for. As physicians, we know LDL, to get an A1C is, yes, that's very important. Does that, but, but it's no surprise that that's not related to cost. Quality and cost don't correlate with one another. And my point is the quality measures we're employing don't actually determine whether quality care is provided. 
So, but we're limited with coded data, but that limitation is only because until recently, we only had information about patients that was in administrative data, uh, and we didn't have this information that's now digitized and we can make sense of. So with big data, right, we can start addressing these issues to abstract information in the chart that's relevant for these quality measures, whether it's for the denominator numerator. And this is the example of ejection fraction. There are many, many different ways in which physicians and others will document, for example, ejection fraction in the encounter note or the procedure note, echocardiographic finding, a myriad of different ways. And it's not just taking a word and adding a code to it. In this case, it's actually looking at the context in which this information exists and actually be able to infer facts from it. So in this case, this was a real example in which this is how the ejection fraction was noted in the, in the document. I had a chance to look at the echocardiogram and I found the LV function was 60%. And from there, you can take this information and then use it for the purposes of determining whether this patient's eligible for this ACO measure. I, I forgot the number, but it's for those with systolic dysfunction, whether or not you're on a beta blocker, right? So using computer-assisted text mining, you can actually be able to get at these facts related to a, I call it facts related to a patient. Use that in, term, with regard to, in addition to your other data you have and inform your decision support, your quality analysis, your reporting, and ultimately get us to understand is quality of care getting better or worse over time and the outcomes there or not. And you can enrich your, the kinds of measures you can inform. Foot exam, another, the bane of, I think, when I used to do, you know, uh, previous companies that I would, uh, I derived, created these payer-based kind of analytic tools of claims data. And, and I know I, I would get in front of, I, I, once it was, we did a um, provider uh, quality measurement for the state of Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts said, I'm tired of paying for physicians uh, who are lower quality. And we said, great, we could do a quality measurement and pay for reporting based upon that. But what happened was when we looked at only the coded data to provide the, you know, whether or not you're a five-star or three-star doc, the doc would tell us, well, I did it. It was in my chart. And one of the, the things that happened over and over again was the dreaded foot exam. Well, foot exams are great for diabetics, but it's dreaded because you can't find anyone with the coded data. Nowhere. So you always have physicians that are... Why are you only providing 10% of your diabetics with a foot exam? No, no, I'm doing much better than that, but it's in, the, it's in the narrative. But there's nowhere in the narrative if you're a clinician that says, I did the foot exam. Nowhere. It doesn't say, I did the foot exam today. It says, I inspected the feet, I did a monofilament test, I inspected the, you know, made sure there's pulses, you know, there's calluses. That's the way physicians document. They don't document like ICD-9, this is da 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 right? Abstracting information taking it, making facts, and using it. This is a study, just a case study, of what we did with the academic institution, the one I talked about earlier, that says, uh, when I'm reporting for PQRS measurement for my Medicare uh, bonuses for docs, another problem, uh, armies of medical students to do this for four months for a reporting is gonna cost me more money than it takes, than the, than the money I'm gonna get back to my institution as a result of the bonuses. There must be a better way. So we, d we created dis uh, machine learning models to operate on the data the way I've described earlier, big data, to actually be able to determine what's the evidence of a dilated eye exam for a G-Pro measure. These are G-Pro measures, that group reporting tool you can use to report PQRS measures using clinical data, not just coded data. Or the diabetic foot exam, or the pneumococcal vaccination. Remember the splenectomy example we described earlier? I'm not saying that computer-assisted text money is perfect, but I'm saying it's gonna get us there better, faster, cheaper. And some of the results here, precision here for those non-statistical minded is predictive positive value, which means if I say that there was a foot exam, if the computer determined it, what was the likelihood it actually is true? 100% means it's always true. Um, accuracy is a measure of both false positive and false negative. So um, pretty good, but it's not uniform. Some are better than others. Pneumococcal vaccination is a hard one. Oh, when you look at the text, it, it, patient, could say, patient was advised but refused. Right? A patient was offered it but didn't really want it. Um, they got it, but they're going to get it tomorrow. You know, all the different ways in which you actually need to determine whether or not one was performed or not. And, you know, so, so but computers could be trained to know all the different linguistics in which physicians idiosyncratically document these kinds of facts related to these measures, and you can make sense of it. And again, that's bringing insights from other industries to healthcare where it's sorely needed. And these are the kinds, some of the results that, that we uh, achieved, and certainly getting better at. And guess what? When you reflect what was done, you actually show that the picture becomes clear. It's no longer that black and white fuzzy TV from the 50s. It's the HD TV that we can see today on the 50 you know, inch you know, big screen, right? 
two-fold improvement in diabetic urine screening in another case study of ours because we were able to determine that microalbumin was obtained in a lab test that happened to be on a piece of paper that LabCorp sent back to the provider. Nowhere in any HL7 feed, nothing in any coded data. These providers aren't getting all payer data, right? So these are the kinds of information we're able to mine and by doing so improve the way in which the providers perform, not by anything they did differently, but just reflecting the services that were done. Um, but not only that, improve upon the eligibility for the measure. So these, this is a coronary disease measure in which you shouldn't be eligible for the measure if you've had a recent clinical bleed event, right? Well, it may not be in the coded data, and by that measure, you shouldn't be eligible for the measure. So you don't want Dr. Mary to go and say, well, you know what, this patient really had a recent bleed contraindicated for this measure, right? So it's not just the numerator, but it's the denominator. Yeah, so the question was, are encoded data, am I including PBM data and coded data? I am, but uh, yes. Uh, you have to realize, though, that these providers um, have access to e-prescribing information. Um, they don't have access to necessarily PBM data. Um, their patients are being seen and cared for uh, or covered by multiple, multiple payers. Um, and so uh, if those data are available, we, we can take that into account. Often the providers, what they have in terms of coded data is what they're in practice management system or what happens to be in their EHR or that you can aggregate from other EHRs within their health system. So the provider has to supply all the data to you? Do you have any relationships with data aggregators, PBMs? Yeah, we do. What I didn't describe is that we have you know, aggregate data aggregation means that can access information from you know, HIEs and claims data, whether it comes from a PBM or whether it comes from a payer. Um, you know, in the big data aspect, the first challenge we had to overcome was, you know, we need to really knit together all the different sources of information, regardless of where it comes from and, and what it is, because the you know the, we need we can't just stop with one particular source. Um, and so this is where I think, you know, this is the new frontier. And I can't say we have the answers here, but if we're going to use text mining to supplement information that's coded, whether from the PBM, the payer, the problem list, to what I call uncover facts related to quality measures, there needs to be a validation step. And this validation step is one in which physicians or others could at least, quote, spot check to determine the accuracy of the text mining because it's not going to be perfect. But depending upon your use, if you're using these results for purposes of population health management, you can, you can tolerate a little bit of noise, right? You can, you can tolerate the fact that you're not going to always be perfect, but you're a lot better than just coded database decision support, a la that splenectomy example I gave you. If you're using it for purposes of reporting to, say, Medicare, you need to maybe validate it every single one at a time, but it's going to be a whole hell of a lot faster uh, than doing it with med armies of medical students going through the, the chart de novo. And even if you go through the chart, again, you may not reflect data that's coming from other sources. So this is something that is new, this validation using the text mining in, the, in, the, in this world of quality measurement. Again, you know, we're, we're working at this forefront, but I think it's one that we need to grapple and get our heads around, because uh, you know, sitting on the soapbox here, making physicians key in information in EHR templates is not the answer to making scalable quality measurement. Here's a third example. We went through, we went through uh, prob accuracy in the problem list. We talked about quality measurement. The third is risk prediction. So risk prediction, um, the basis for much of what we're trying to do in targeting, identifying, stratifying populations for management is understanding risk. Understanding risk, of course, is, is only as good as the data you use to inform your risk models. The better, more accurate risk models will enable you to real more optimally allocate your resources. Care managers won't be calling certain patients or thinking that they're a high risk when in fact they're not necessarily high risk or vice versa. Um, and so it's like you're sending people out to do things based on inaccurate or incomplete data. It, it really makes no sense and at the end of the day may be more costly and may have unintended or suboptimal outcomes. Risk prediction, I'm just going to describe for you, hospital readmissions is now the, you know, one of the hot uh, topics now that penalties are underway with respect to readmissions for, for Medicare. Um, interestingly, a study done in JAMA, a meta-analysis, showed that all the models that have been created to date in terms of predicting readmission um, are really, you know, a little better than a coin flip. And they're, they're operating on data that is coded and, uh, and the utility of the models were unclear. It was easy, actually easier to predict mortality than readmissions. Uh, and this is the best of breed that's out there. 
So next generation predictive analytics, we hear this a lot. I know we hear this in the industry a lot. Well, if we can use all the data, we would be better at our ability to fit. Yes, it's true. But how do you operate on all those information that's volume and variety and all the things that I talked about? Big data is a noun, right? Yes, we have the structured data, but we also have all of this text and images. Images not only are just radiology images, but images are also those information that's scanned in to me being part of the record. And then we do have you know, other types of information, geospatial and web-based and all the others, but that's all other text data that's not structured in any format that is easily computable. Um, so by using that, uh, our new world of thinking about risk prediction is thinking about the patient as a multidimensional vector of all of the different conditions and all the different uh, attributes of that patient. By taking all the textual information, coded information, and creating this, this mathematical view, which gets you to better risk prediction without getting into all the specifics, it actually gets you to do things like cohort matching that is better than propensity matching gets you in a way that actually does virtual clinical trials. You can actually run your own, uh, you know, patients like me kind of a result, much the way that um, Chris Longhurst uh, published recently uh, in terms of what he did at uh, Stanford for pediatric patients. Um, for doing this, and, and I want to, Pixio has worked with a case study with a company called Clinicast uh, that does a very innovative uh, risk analytics. And, and what basically we did together was to mine our data and the richness of both textual and coded data. This was for a small population of patients and fed those data in a data model that can be computed upon by Clinicast. Clinicast then ran this to create a predictive model of readmissions within six months and found even with this very small limited data set, 73% accuracy to differentiate between high and low risk patients for an admission to hospital. Small subset, uh, but we're doing better than yeah, these data that have been published to date, given the fact that we're operating upon the entirety of the data that we have about the patient. So in summary, because I know we're, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, there's uh, this revolution underway in healthcare is only going to go so far. Certainly, there's process oriented changes and care delivery changes that need to happen to affect population management. But what we would say is we're only going to be as good as we're only going to be as good as the information we can operate upon to make the kinds of insights we need to truly understand variations in care, appropriate utilization, appropriate quality, and what are the outcomes that we'd like to achieve and what's related to that. And we got to operate on these data, most of 90% of which is unstructured, and we got to do it in a way that can enable real time. So we got to bring in the modern technologies and computing power that other industries have been able to take advantage of. Um, and by the way, this, it, it's unfortunate, but when you look at this, to do the kind of work I just described, relational databases aren't going to get you there. They're the, all of the, this, the SQL databases, 50 tables and all that. Ain't gonna, they ain't gonna cut it. So there's a revolution happening in healthcare and there has to be a revolution in the technology employed in healthcare that's gonna get us there informed by what's done outside of healthcare. Um, and again, we're using open source tools from outside of healthcare like from Facebook and Google because they have tackled these problems, albeit for a different, what we call use case. Um, again, unstructured data will untap lots of insights. Actually, you're gonna see more about evidence-based medicine than we have today, only 30%. Only 30% of the medicine that's practiced today I, that is actually at all evidence-based. It's based on non-generalizable, small, relatively small clinical trials and the like, or expert opinion. I think when you're looking to look at these unstructured information and put together data on massive scale, you're going to start to see signal that's going to really change the way we think about the best ways to care for patients and populations. Uh, and that's the revolution that's going to be underway. It's not just population management, but it's going to be the way in which we care uh, for, for, uh, for patients. Um, I'll leave you with one thing that's really interesting um, in a paper that will hopefully be published very soon. This is work that we had done with, with Stanford. Stanford was able to look at data for 10 years on about 2 million patients. They were able to predict six years, as much as six years prior to FDA recalls whether or not the drugs, in this case Vioxx, actually caused a greater incidence of myocardial infarction. From looking at data, both textual and coded, and running virtual trials to determine whether or not the conditions we're seeing in the patients taking Vioxx was an indication for use or an adverse event. So we didn't have to wait for folks to tell us whether or not there's some side effect they're reporting. You can see it in the data, but you need to have it and you need to operate on it. 
Um, anyway, so with that, I'll stop and take any questions. And I was told to actually for folks to use the microphone, but if you're uh, right over here, but if you don't like to, I can just simply repeat the question. So for the benefit of those uh, who are going to be viewing this online. So thank you. So the question was, how does one deal with the problem that in the medical record there are bound to be errors of interpretation, errors of documentation, or errors of judgment with respect to the patient? And there was an example about the medical student that may have misinterpreted an echocardiographic finding. Um, well, the answer is, I think, that there's always going to be what we call noisy data. Um, if you have enough of it, there, there are ways to actually take the entirety of the patient chart to determine that that medical student misinterpreted an echographic finding, but you have the procedure note somewhere else that actually provides that uh, finding, and then you can potentially wait or simply present those data to the physician. So the other thing to say is it's not necessarily computers making judgments. It's taking information in its entirety, presenting it in a way, depending on the use case, and presenting it to the person that can make a decision. Yes. So that example where we talked about diabetes uncomplicated and here are the notes and counter notes from which we took the information, we said, look, there were two or three encounter notes from which we understood these information. So for validation purposes, getting back to validation for facts, for measures, if the use case is I have to report to Medicare and I have to be damn well sure that in fact it's the case, we're going to report all of the conflicts. If it's for population management in which, again, you could tolerate a little bit of what we call noise, then in this case we may not be as rigid about that uh, because the consequences are not as great. But you have to, anything you do with text mining has to be use case specific. It's not one size fits all. And it's a great point that you, that you raise. Question. Right, so the question was, um, offices are now in the process and continue to be, especially historic notes, um, scanning those doc paper charts that were handwritten. And the question was, I think, could we recognize handwritten notes? Uh, and the question is, no. Uh, the limitations of optical character reader technology is such that handwritten notes are, um, they're not resolved to any kind of clarity that gives you any any meaningful signal. So, so that's a gap. And, and so that, that's, that's, you know, um, the way I joke, and I don't want to be flip about it, is I can't even read my own handwriting. Um, so though that is still a, that's going to be a data gap that we wouldn't fill. Yeah. I would say this, that um, in those clients we've worked with that have paper charts, there usually is, not always, there usually is enough sort of dictated notes, right, that are typewritten that, uh, that, that get you some of the way. But, but, but certainly um, it is the case. The state of the art is such where recognizing handwritten notes is, uh, is an issue. Oh, certainly. S certainly. Yeah, so certainly the technologies are improving. And what we call recall, the ability to actually take some handwritten note and actually resolve it into some English that looks like something you can use is getting better. Um, we're just not there yet.
Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a limitation at this point, yeah. Question? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So the question is, anyone uh, estimate the cost of converting this based on a usable format? So um, I could just tell you that we do this um, with our customers today. Um, the costs on the national level. Um, yeah. Right. I can only say for what we're doing, but again, when you start to get to, so there's an 80-20 rule, right? When you get to the 10 largest EHRs that we work with, you know, you can get to a point where you may be in the, you know, billions, you know, low billions. I mean, this is just off, the, off my top of my head. When you start to get to the 20% that use these EHRs that are very much niche, the interfaces need to be created. You know, you need to create interfaces and connectivity points so you can liberate the data. There's no cost estimates that I've heard. No, there's no cost estimates that I've heard. Um, I do know this that um, uh, I know Kaiser is going to spend in, in a lot of money to do this for themselves, um, and we, you can only extrapolate from there. It, it, it well could be, especially when you get to those what I call pockets, the black holes of data that resides in the corners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's that's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good thing to be done. I haven't seen anything published. Jan. Um, it was a lot there. So I guess the question is, is this, I think if I can boil this down, is this really going to address our cost dilemma? Is this going to reduce potentially more costs? Because there is a human element to uh, looking at what has been mined from information where that data isn't coded. Um, well, there, there's a lot there. I mean, certainly um, we do envision a, a, a uh, again, for the use case purposes, a steps in which you have some validation occurring on what we're extracting. Um, I would say just, by, I, I can only say that by looking, and by the way, no one really validates coded data. I mean, we take claims data sacrosanct. Uh, I, I could tell you that that, yes, that is. Uh, Yeah, I could see the day, well, I'll, I'll say this, I can see the day and the day is here where um, your problem list is supplemented with these are problems we've understood from the chart, or these are problems that you may have put down. I'll tell you what, yes, the coded data from a physician is sacrosanct, but I could tell you many times about chart lore, but w let's put that aside. Let's put aside that, you know, that diabetic is coded for diabetic, there's no evidence for it. I would say this, that if you, I think that over time, the value you're going to receive from these data that you're able to mine and present in a way that can be validated, Jan, I would say is going to greatly outweigh 
the benefit is going to greatly outweigh the cost. And I would still say that with, with computing power the way it is and with these data to be structured in a way that can be useful, um, you're going to get to where you want to be. We're not where we want to be in healthcare right now. Uh, and I would say to you that you can either make manual processes of using, you can either close your eyes and not look at unstructured data, you can make someone manually abstract the chart, or you can, um, l let, me, let me give you one example. So, so there's a 27 hospital health system in the California, Northern California, who basically has a problem with, um, let's call it patients who seek care outside of the health of the system. If we're gonna actually make ACOs work, you're gonna have to have actually the ability to know who's going outside and inside your network for care. They, as with many, don't know who's, which of their non-managed patients is going where, because all that information's in the document. Now, how can you manage against that? Now, you can have someone, and I did this in my head, you can actually have someone go through all five million patient records. Well, actually, their managed care is probably less than that, whatever the number is. And I, I calculate, it's gonna take 10 years. 10 years for someone to look through it, just for one report, to determine this huge problem. Um, or you can do something similar to this with some validation to make sure you're, you're, and you can get the results for a quarterly report that you can manage against and actually save money. Not just money, but get patients to go to the people who are the lowest cost providers. When today what happens is you're referring over to the other side of the street because you train with that guy, and that guy happens to be at an academic medical center apart from your network here. So I, I, I just think that if you do any sort of economic studies on any use cases, I, I think my assertion to you would be that you're going you're gonna to derive lots of value, and you're going to do so in a more cost-efficient manner. Like every other industry. Right? Google is the best, most powerful advertising engine that the humans have ever seen. Much more efficiently than anything that anyone could ever figure out in putting ads in papers and whatever else. I mean, because Google is an advertising uh, company, it's not a search company. Um, search is, is, is a way they do what they do. Question? Yeah, so the question was the partnership opportunities with payers. So those, enti yeah, so those entities that are more at risk for healthcare costs are gonna be more interested in this. And I would say to you, what's gonna make an ACO work? Understanding of quality, understanding of variations in care, understanding and managing your network. And again, I, I actually, I won't be surprised if mid next year you're gonna have CFOs losing their jobs or literally taking a lot of Pepsid when they realize that the shared savings aren't going to come about and the quality measurements that they're relying upon are not going to just demonstrate uh, results. And they're going to look at their EHR and they're going to say, what the hell just happened? I just spent $150 million for this thing. And the data models, there are no data models in the EHR to do any sort of analytics. And we can't even interoperate upon data when I've got other practices that I've acquired that are on different EHRs. And so I, I I, the day will be coming, and I hope that it doesn't mean the death of the accountable care model. I hope it just means that we haven't thought through really how you're going to operate on these data. Question? Yeah, so that meta tagging that I just described is applying structure to the data because you don't want, every time you can compute upon something, you don't want to do it de novo, right? You don't want to have to go back to the same. So what you want to do is you want to say, how do I create these information in a structured format that then I can later on operate on? So it's kind of like you, you have your data, you aggregate it, and then you create this kind of analytic patient model, as you're describing. Certainly, that's, that's, a, um, that's a step. I think there's two things to consider with that. One, you lose information when you start coding. It's a lossy system. 
number one. And, and number two is Dr. Mary over there, she, ain't, she doesn't have time in her day to do that. She, she, she doesn't. And she's going to be doing this a lot to the patient. Uh, I don't want that either. I don't want to go to a primary care physician that's doing that, I'll tell you that. Just do your stuff. Practice at the, I know it's used so often, I, I, I don't like it, but practice at the top of your license, right. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, you've really been attentive, especially on a Friday. I appreciate it, thank you so much.